Hello, and uh, good to be with you in, what's it now, day six of the lockup. I'm Alec Hogg from Biz News, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome Paula Quincy. Uh, Paula is going to take us through a short presentation, and when we are finished with that, we will be around for questions. But first of all, we better check that all the tech is working 100%, and my colleague Stuart Lohman, the managing editor of Biz News, is the man who's, uh, well, pulling all the controls, Stuart. Thanks, Alec. Always good to be here, and thanks for joining, Paula. Um, for those who are on the line, can you just click, there's a little high five um, option on your control panel on the right-hand side. If you can see the couple with their face masks and hear my voice, can you just high five us so that we know that it's coming through clearly? Okay, excellent. Um, we also like to keep the webinars very conversational, as those who've joined before do know there's a little questions bar on the control panel. If you just drop down that menu and you put them in, Alec and myself will flag them with Paula, who's obviously the key guest today. Over to you, Alec. Thanks, Stu. Uh, we'll also have John Foster Pedley, the Dean of Henley Business School, with us later. But Paula, let's uh, let's hear a little bit from you. We know that people are trying to adjust to the lockdown and uh, some times it's a little challenging uh, when you have your personal space invaded by uh, your significant other um, but on the other hand it's also an opportunity maybe you can just take us through you got a, you got some lovely pictures in your presentation uh, and just uh, tell us about the relationship lockdown Thanks so much and thanks for having me here. And yes, as you rightly said, um, a lot of couples are being tested or their relationship is being tested right now with being in lockdown. Um, and, and you know, linked to that is a lot of other emotions that we're going through on a personal level, um, from a family dynamics point of view, and also from a workplace perspective, which just is obviously contributing to what some couples and families are experiencing at the moment. So yeah, today I just want to highlight some, some points around um, how to deal with relationship being in lockdown from a self point of view, from a family point of view, and hopefully um, help people out there just manage and cope with the situation a lot better. So what we're finding is that a lot of couples um, have gone from being busy, um, so busy from a work point of view, and, you know, a lot of people can go to work and escape the home environment, so to speak. Um, it gives them some distance between each other some time away from each other um, you know where they can kind of reflect or get you know focus on other things before they come back to the home environment in the evening but now being in such a confined space we're finding that a lot of people are going from busy to they now have a lot of um, time on their hands um, because your normal day-to-day -day routine has been disrupted um, and it's how do I make the best of my time um, from a work deliverable point of view as well as from managing the, the general household daily routine so the washing the cooking the cleaning and the etc and then on top of that kids as well if you happen to have children and managing the dynamics around them not you know having to homeschool or self-study and making sure that they're still needing to do what needs to be done and then on top of it if you are both having to work from home you are now in each other's spaces you're both trying to manage with work stress and deliverables get to grips with a new normal in terms of a routine so working online working remotely um, and just basically surviving on a on a normal day day-to-day -day situation so we need to start off with how, how can I take care of myself first in terms of self-care. Um, and it's really about, as we often hear on the airlines, is put your own mask on first. Because you can't take care of others if you're not taking care of yourself first. So understanding where you are at emotionally, what are you feeling, what are you experiencing, and how do you share this with your partner? Um, how can you be completely honest with each other and say this is the support that I need from you right now or this is what I'm going through right now and this is how I need you to be there for me um, so that we can be there for each other as a couple as a relationship and then secondly from if you have children from a family perspective um, and taking care of family 
But family also goes further than that in terms of our um, family needs and extended family. So we may also be concerned about um, our family members that may be high risk. So for example, elderly, potentially people that are staying on their own, um, or people that have um, health issues that could put them into a high risk category. So then it's also looking at how do we manage the family dynamics and um, keeping in contact with family, whether they be close by, whether they be somewhere else in the world that is also being impacted by what's going on in the world right now. Linked to that then is obviously when it comes to friends and social groups and the reason why all of these are important is because they all provide a sense of support and support structures that can either impact us in terms of adding to our stress or they can actually help us get through the current situation by putting these support structures in place and particularly if you've got people that are living on their own so i'm talking single parents as an example and you may not have the help of a partner to help you with kids or just to help you um, you know on your own this is where you can tap into friends and social groups as a support structure to get you through what is potentially going on in your world right now and that can be whether it be friends from a social perspective or it could even be um, you know work colleagues and people in the workplace um, sometimes our work colleagues become extended family to us as well and this is where it's extremely important from a work environment point of view where we still remain connected particularly if you are in a leadership position um, you know, relationships are critical now, particularly when it comes to human skills. I know a lot of people like to refer to it as soft skills, but I like to call it human skills, where it's about checking in with our employees and our people in our work environment and how are they coping, what are they going through, because obviously there is the added stress of the financial impact. And I've heard of some companies where um, they've had to do, implement salary cuts um, or percentages or whether people are being asked to take compulsory leave and unpaid leave and potentially even the risk of companies closing down and retrenchments and people losing their jobs. So there's a lot of stress here at a, on, a, on a human level that we are dealing with. So when it comes to remote work um, and working with colleagues, some of the things that you need to put in place to help you get through this is how do you structure your day that it seems like some kind of normal? Because the normal as we know it is not normal anymore. And so from a self point of view, from a, from a relationship point of view, try and stick to your same daily routine as much as possible. This gives you a sense of control over your day and over your environment, as opposed to feeling like the world is coming at you and it's complete chaos and you have no control your world is running away with you this is equally important if you have children because children pick up on our anxiety they pick up on our stress levels and when their sense of safety and security so in other words their caregivers or parents are anxious and stressed it gives them a sense of uncertainty and instability and they will potentially start acting out um, what they're experiencing and what they're feeling so it depends obviously on your kids ages and the the sense of emotional maturity and whether they are able to give context to what's going on in their worlds but the younger they are they don't necessarily have that emotional vocabulary to express what they're feeling and what they're going through and they will potentially act out which can add more friction to relationships so from a relationship point of view it's very important for couples to understand and expect friction it is going to happen so sit down and discuss as a couple how are we going to deal with getting through the next couple of days and or weeks because right now we have a defined period of time that we are focusing on we're focusing on a lockdown period of 21 days but if we look at the trends going around us um, in terms of other parts of the world that is highly probable that it may be extended and so right now we're focusing on 21 days and we know that there's an end date in sight, but that could be extended. 
So as a couple, how do we manage the friction? So it would be sitting down and discussing with each other that we know we're going to get into each other's spaces and faces. How do we manage that in a healthy way versus a toxic way? So in other words, one example would be, well, we're not going to become volatile. In other words, we're not going to name, blame, shame, um, call each other, you know, swear at each other, all those kind of things. Oh, yeah. All good. Sorry. All right. Thanks for that. Okay, John. Uh, we are uh, Paula. Uh, John has uh, just joined, uh, joined us now. Hi, John. Welcome, John. I'm sorry for the interruption. I just came in without muting my mic. I'll keep quiet in the background now. <laughs> no, well, Paula's nearly finished now. We we had a uh, she's she's just taking us through her thoughts on this, and uh, we'll get into the whole remote world in just a moment. Paula. Yes, thank you. So going back to couples, um, you know, first of all, agree on how you're going to manage the conflict and the confrontation. If B, um, give each other some time to cool off. Um, if you are able to, um, find um, a dedicated space in the house where you can both work from, if you're both having to work from home, so that you're not speaking over each other and working over each other. Take turns in terms of how you need to schedule and manage the kits. Um, so if you have key deliverables that you both have to um, achieve within the day, try and manage your schedule around each other that one of you takes turns with the kids if you need to and, and supervise and get the kids focused and allowing the other one time to get on and do what they need to do and then swapping and rotating if need. Also agree on how you're going to manage your household chores. Um, so that it feels like it's a shared responsibility and it's not just left up to one or, or the other of you to manage it because this can um, cause more frustration and it can also result in resentment being built up between the two of you in that I'm the one that's cooking and cleaning and taking care of the household while you're just getting on with life, so to speak. Communication is key, um, really sharing how you're feeling, um, what you're anxious about. Um, also having that serious conversation about how will we cope if one of us does happen to get the virus? How will we self-quarantine, medication, healthcare, those kind of things? Because it is a very big reality that one of us is potentially going to get it. This is also a time where couples um, can turn towards each other and use the time as a positive to invest in their relationship and invest in each other. And there's three key questions that couples can ask themselves during this period. It's what's working for us right now as a relationship and as a couple? What are some areas that we can improve on? Um, so areas that are potentially not working that well that we can improve on. And then how can we be better partners for each other and for our children and for the family unit as a whole? Um, giving Paula, each other um, yeah. Paula, we've got a lot of questions, so maybe you can wrap up now with a presentation, please. Sure. So, yeah, um, really tapping into, from an individual point of view, what keeps you grounded and what keeps your own emotions in check and what helps you to cope with it, whether it's spirituality or from a faith perspective. Um, and then also... Uh, really just looking at going from the um, the head to the heart and bringing back human connection and bringing back um, the emotional level. That's the next slide. Thanks, Alec. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of human connection, and this is where human skills and human relationships are being very key at the moment. We've seen reports coming out of China that since they've come out of lockdown, that their divorce rate has increased. We've also seen um, results or reports coming out of France that um, uh, domestic violence has increased by 30%, um, which is a very big concern here in our country with being in confined spaces, particularly where relationships are very toxic and volatile already. And then uh, really just going to the next slide is that um, it's really around that um, uh, relationships make the world go round and that's relationships in both our personal level as well as in our professional space and how do we tap into that and bring in the human skills. Um, the very big risk of having self-isolation and connection, um, next slide thanks Alex, which is the, the, the looming um, loneliness epidemic and the risk of depression 
And we've seen that chronic loneliness can have an impact on our immune systems to the same degree that is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And this is where if people are feeling that they're not coping, um, they can tap into our national resources and national support centers. Um, the numbers should be on the screen shortly. Thanks, Alec. Um, to please reach out for help if you don't have access to your um, employee wellness and, and well-being um, support structures like ICAS, please reach out to the national support centers and get help. Don't feel that you are alone in this. There are support structures in place that can help you. And then lastly, yeah, if anybody is needing any help along these lines, you're welcome to reach out to me as well. And I'm able to um, assist you or refer you to the various networks and forums that I'm involved in. Brilliant. Paula, thanks for giving us that background. Uh, John, I had a, a fascinating chat yesterday, last night, uh, with um, Dr. Alexandra Samuel. She wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal, which was their top read story of the past week all about working from home. She's done it for 22 years. And uh, it was very interesting what Paula was saying, because four years ago, her husband also started working from home. And there were some <laughs> real challenges, some of those that, that we've actually gone through at the moment. Her uh, off the cuff kind of response to this is, when you have other people in the house, make sure if you're working from home or spending time at home, that you all have noise reducing headphones, which uh, is a little difficult to access if you don't have them yet, but an interesting part, which again aligns with what Paula was saying, find your own space. Yeah, I can totally emphasize with that. I remember going to a Nickelback concert a while ago and I chewed up my ticket to stick in my ears to save my ears, the noise was so loud. So I don't recommend that, but you do need to do something. I totally emphasize. I have to be careful what I say here, Ali, because my wife Carla is listening, and so um, I'm going to be very measured in what I say. I just like to say quickly, she's doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Stuart uh, is handling the questions, as we said right in the beginning. Actually, Stuart, do you want to just uh, take us through how you load questions again for those who might have joined us late? Yes, thanks, Alec. So just on the control panel on the right-hand side, there's a questions drop-down. Uh, there. If you click that and drops down, you just put your questions in there and I'll shoot them through. Um, Alec, I've got more a comment, but I think it's around routine. Um, Paula, it's from Hanno Becker. He says, what I, what I find works for me is to focus on the family during the day and work from 9 p.m. to about 2 a.m. daily. That gives me about five hours to focus uninterrupted. <laughs> I'd love to get uh, Paula's view on that one, but just to add to it, uh, a good friend of mine, Gus Silber, who's a, a full-time writer, when years ago, when I first started uh, working from home, I phoned him and said, how do you do this freelance stuff? He said that the secret to this is to work within the times that it makes sense for you. And in his case, it was something similar to what Hannah has just said now. He, in fact, I think in Gus's case, he, start, he works from... Uh, from about nine o'clock to 2 a.m. and then he spends his mornings with his kids and so on. So it's an interesting point, Paula. Absolutely and this is where it does come down to personal choice and what does work for you and to put that routine in place. However, in saying that, lack of sleep can also add to irritability and mood swings and can contribute to uh, conflict in in the in the household so yeah just to be aware of um you know that you are getting enough sleep as well and to manage your energy levels john thanks paula um yeah something a... uh, paul, john, go, ahead. go ahead yeah we're we waiting for you john okay so I think one of the most important things under these circumstances is to make sure, try and carve out enough space. It's interesting that some research has shown that the optimal space, if you're working alone at home, is 30 square meters, so five by six. Now, not everyone's got that, but if you can carve out that sort of space, it gives you a sufficient separation to be able to do your stuff. And if you can use noise cancelling devices, I think that's a great idea. Um, but people need a little bit of space um, under lockdown. So if you can find ways in which to Give you that space to begin with that's the start and of course the next stage is i'm sure we'll talk about this extensively is about how you establish some form of routine or regularity I mean, it's really important in relatively chaotic situations to try and find points of constancy and structure um, that give you a, a sense of groundedness 
But if you add chaos on chaos, you, you've just got anarchy. So when you're in these situations where so much has changed, so many routines have changed, so your work routines, you're in with family, of course the, the mind and the, and the emotions are stretched um, tremendously. So try and find those elements of structure, routine, patterns, space, as much as you can to allow yourself to go and recover. Interesting point that, that Hanno made, that he worked for five hours, and um, before we, we pick up another question, that was also uh, the the point that was made uh, by Dr. Samuel, when she said that when you work from home, your five hours are, almost, are, are usually the equivalent to eight hours in the office, because you don't have interruptions, you don't have the water cooler conversations, etc. And she said, if you start, if you stop being guilty, um, that you aren't putting in a full eight hour shift as it were and and stick it down to five hours that is also one of the ways that you go forward and i think it it, it talks to what you were saying paula about getting your balance and getting your relationships working better absolutely and i think the risk with some people though is you you can blur the lines between work and home life and you can get caught up in just working longer and longer hours so potentially as in terms of that routine to kind of end the day or begin the day whichever it might be for you and your your schedule but um what we've started doing um working from home is scheduling um you know end of day catch-ups with people so like a five o'clock in the afternoon where we take some time out outside, we go and catch up with some friends or some family members online and just to you know, have that mental break of being in the same space and it's a work environment and a, and a home environment. Great tip. Stu? Thanks, uh, Paula. Um, Karen's got a point on how can you cope with blended families during this time when children and attention can become a contentious issue? And I suppose with COVID, it is an extreme situation because kids are usually at school during the day. Mm, I think that's right up your street, Paula. Yeah, yeah. Blended families, you know, particularly um, if your routine has been um, upset, because um, generally kids would take turns going from one house to the other if you are sharing different households, or if you are a blended family in one family unit. It would be how, and this is where you can actually involve the kids in this by sitting down with the kids and saying, right, and let's come up with ideas collectively and together um, and give each person a turn to come up with an idea of how we can handle this as a family. And this is really going to test your team building skills as well, because this is, you're a team at home um, and every child has unique different needs. And this is where it's important to do things collectively as a family unit, but also individually one on one with each parent and child to build that individual relationship with the kids too. Excellent. Uh, Dave's, got a, Dave's got a question on routine. He says, why is so much emphasis focused on the norm when it comes to routine? It's no longer the norm. So surely routine must adapt to the new world of working. Are we not just looking for comfort or regularity? Hmm. John, do you want to give that a go? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I studied in my life is complexity theory, which is it's becoming quite interesting at this moment, um, where you, know, you can try and put rigid routines in place. Um, and that's fine if you can foresee the future, that those are going to be uh, stable. But we're working in complex environments where we are sense making. Suddenly everyone's thrown into a home where we've got to make sense of this, of this thing. Now, you can get very regimented about it and say that's how, good, how it's going to work, but it's not going to work in a flexible family inventive environment, which is when you've got the kids there, you've got your family working. Um, my wife's a doctor, she's working from, a, she works here, she's consulting online, etc. I'm, you know, leading a business school, so I'm, I'm endlessly on Zoom calls, etc. So I think it's important that you do try and find um, some sort of, sort, of, sort of structure, but in the very early days, you've got to be pretty merciful on yourself. Um, you've got to understand that, to begin with, you're experimenting. We told our kids, look, we don't know how this is going to pan out. Work out what you want to do. Work out some routine. It doesn't involve being on the iPad too much. And um, do some self-invention and self-discovery. And it probably is the first time in their life they've had the freedom to try and create their own structures, their own lifestyle, their own sort of way of living they'd like to have for a while. So it's become quite fascinating to see now that's evolving as well. So we're actually getting autonomous playing a flute, for example, rather than being chased into it. So it's, it's really fascinating to see how everyone adapts around each other. Now, I think if one maintains a sort of sense of experimentation, 
calm and a sense of humor, you'll find unusual patterns emerging, which can be quite creative and um, interesting. Yeah, it's so interesting. We've we've been running a remote company at BizNews literally since we started. We we have got an office at WeWork that we go into in normal conditions, but it's it's been we've had the privilege, I think all of us, in, in having a little space in our home where that's our, our working space. But I can also relate to it that you re, you, you you to make it work properly, uh, you've got to be more self-disciplined than I am. Uh, and often we have conversations about that, um, but it, it does bring all kinds of other opportunities too. In that, when you get the, the commuting out of the way, you do have more time to walk the dogs, spend uh, the conversations with your family, and so on. Stu, I know you you know you and I've worked together for a long time, uh, and you you have little kids. So, what's how have you managed the uh, the conflict there between? working from home and and having children around yeah thanks Alec. um the issue on routine is key with the kids in terms of what we find mom or dad you know because they are three and seven so we've had to build a routine around that at least one of us is off whether it be an hour or whatever to sort of entertain and stuff and then and that's when the other one can focus purely on work and stuff and also as you know Alec, i'm a not an early bird and a late owl so there's, that's where a lot of time is spent for work as well so but i think routine on our side is key and sticking to a routine just to help kids as well who need the routine at such a young age okay more questions um, i got a comment from bernard he talks about exercise he says it's more a comment though he says it's a way of giving your own space as well as keeping fit and healthy and he says luckily his garden is a reasonable size so him and his wife can do about two to five kilometers a day. <laughs> well, it, can... you look like, from your picture, yeah, it looks like you do exercise quite quite a lot. <laughs> so I can relate to that because um, I have been running loops around my garden to keep me sane. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, that, that was part of our routine um, before we went into lockdown. We were the early bird risers. We went off to gym or we did some form of exercise early in the morning and for for me I just find that it helps set my, the tone of my day it puts me in a positive frame of mind I feel energized and I can then get stuck into my work and I think it's whatever works for you that gives you that that time out um, to connect with yourself to re-energize yourself whether it's meditating whether it's sitting quietly on the balcony or the garden sipping a cup of tea or whatever it might be for you but it does there's lots of research showing that exercise and those feel-good endorphins is a positive john uh, what's your thoughts on on making time for exercise um, uh, it's absolutely critical, uh, and and there's so much available now. Um, there's online, there's online uh, gym sessions which are relatively cheap. I mean, uh, Carla does that every morning now, um, and and they're really amazingly engaging. I mean, some of these people are uh, sort of actors and actresses in their own right. They're able to energize and run up the camera and be crazy. It's it's really fun. Um, if you've got a little bit of space, if you're privileged enough to have a tennis court, you can actually walk round and round and round and round that in a sort of meditative state as well, other than just playing playing tennis. Um, so I think it's really important to get the body moving. Even if you do 20 minutes of you know reasonable walking, it's, it's better than nothing. If you do an hour, and then you need very small spaces, I think, to do some of this stuff. I remember yeah. a time from the Canadian Air Force years back where they did isotonics you could just lean against walls or press against your own muscles and get a really good workout so this is a time for creativity i think in that but i i think it's enormously important to stay grounded stay real and to settle the mind because it's under quite a lot of stress at the moment i i, I wrote about it in the daily insight a little while ago uh, about uh, a friend of ours uh, sally flanagan who has a yoga studio now you can imagine uh, the yoga studio shuts down because of of well before the lockdown just because of the spread and she's now gone online and all of her teachers are doing live yoga sessions uh, including hot yoga which if you've got a heater you heat up the room and away you go and it's just like being in the studio but what is interesting john is that so much creativity and innovation from businesses is now being put into the marketplace and there's a very good example with gyms and yoga studios and so on maybe when we come out of this 
the world will be different and they might have found new revenue streams. Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. Go, John. So I think that's absolutely true. I mean, just as a look at our business, which is a business school, which is you know typically predicated mainly on face-to-face -face interaction, because and, and the belief is that's the only way you can do it. Um, we, we switched over ten days, um, so by the time lockdown happened, we were in full virtual mode with a range of very interesting creative facilitators, independent people who've done a whole range of things, whether they're creatives or, or therapists or, or educators. It was unbelievable the amount of energy and engagement they had with reinventing what they were doing. What was apparently impossible before, and the sort of received wisdom says, no, you can't do that, turned out to be far from impossible. And what's interesting about the virtual world when you're engaging, like when you look at a class or an audience, they're quite distant. When you've got the right kit, and that's really a big monitor or two, you see everyone's face is really up close. You, know, you can really emote with people and you can really have quite deep engagements with people through the screen. I mean, and, and we know that because we watch films, don't we? And we watch social media and we watch these little videos that people make. They make us laugh and make us cry. So it's fully possible to have not only an intellectual engagement through screens, but a very emotive and very personal one as well. And I can only imagine that that capability and technology is going to increase. So that will never leave us. I think we've, we've, we'll have shifted um, through this in, in a way that probably we should have done or could have done before. Thanks, John. I think there's more, a lot of comments more than questions, but I'll read them out as we go and we can just feed off those. Um, Barbara says, with my office having worked remotely for over a year, we have decided to put ourselves in the headspace of our clients and customers who are doing this for the first time. We have split the time into three blocks. The first week we are using to catch up on our own app and let our customers get into a rhythm, so not bothering them much. Later this week we'll move into a connection phase of can we have a quick video chat. And the third week will be more preparation for operating as before and generating momentum for sales, etc. Nice. Paula, oh, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. we would you like to we we cut in you Paula no that um that's a great because it shows you know that they've they've put some kind of a structure as in mapping out what they're focusing on over the next couple of weeks and um you know it depends on i think the type of profile or personality you are coming back to routine and structure some people may not be that disciplined and that structured in terms of the way they like to work they may be more big picture orientated and that's why i think it's coming back to understanding your type of personality and what works best for you if you're the kind of person that needs structure and routine and and discipline put that in place for you if you're the kind of big picture person then maybe it's just about allocating specific tasks that you want to accomplish um, through this period of lockdown from an exercise point of view one thing that i have been seeing and hearing a lot of is people are using the time to declutter not only mentally but physically as well and that's also a good form of exercise. So if you want to clean out all your cupboards and your garage and everything, that's also going to give you a good workout. Thanks, Paula. Um, there's a question here from John Wilkinson. He's asking for some suggestions for the right kit for remote work. So probably more practical op ideas around working remotely. Well, uh, given that we've been doing it for so long, John, I can uh, tell you that, first of all, uh, Apple computers are a must because the whole ecosystem uh, talks to each other. We also use quite a few apps. We use Slack, uh, and now the Stuart and I are communicating, in fact, on Slack um, while we're going through this, uh, this webinar to just uh, make sure that things go smoothly. But our whole team have got different channels on Slack. I know there's Microsoft Teams that uh, big companies are starting to use and, and really engage with now but uh, that would be a, a must from uh, my perspective um, the the most popular of the video conferencing calls is zoom uh, but uh, we find that um, this uh, go to webinar and go to meeting works very well that does require a license it's a lot more stable um, and then you've also got google hangouts which is a a very useful and free uh, but you need to have a google account or a gmail account to use that one uh, Stu, uh, what are the other um, uh, tools that we apply aggressively? 
Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, obviously, G Suite as Microsoft Teams, which is a great one because you can house all documents, etc., in, in either locked file drives ex as well, which allows everyone to access them. So it moves away from that old concept of on PC, but into the cloud, which I think is very important. I mean, yeah, it's just communication. Alec, as you say, I think you find the right communication tool for your team, and it allows you, and it's an open communication, sort of no holds barred. You have your as you mentioned, different channels, but you have your water cooler channels, etc., so that it's not all work. There is a bit of lightheartedness, etc., that runs around the team. Um, so that's what I'd say from my side. We're very fortunate as well uh, to have WhatsApp as a, a almost ubiquitous within South Africa. So that's a good way of communicating and talking uh, when you're on the move. Um, what do you guys think, John, Paula? Anything to add? So Loom is another oh, one that I. Sorry, John. Paula? Paula, after you. Um, Loom is another platform that I've heard of and um, played with uh, very briefly where you can pre-record um, stuff. So, for example, in instructional videos. So, if you're wanting to take an employee or somebody through a process or something you want them to do, you can screenshot your screen, pre-record it, and then send it back to them. Um, is another one that's that's um, out there as well. Well, I was also going to say, Alec, what's key on us, not just practical, I mean, we do talk about a chief happiness officer. So it's someone who actually manages the team from a different focus, which is quite key because you you find out, you know, someone who's touching base with the, with the employees and seeing how they, you know, what's on their minds, how they're feeling, stuff that you don't necessarily see via a video conference, etc. So I think that's quite key as well in terms of building a team remotely. That's critical. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a Chief Happiness Officer from day one. And her role literally is to keep people engaged because the easiest thing uh, when you don't have contact uh, is that is disengagement. We know how hard that is uh, to maintain without connections. Something else, uh, an, another app that um, you can add to your uh, to your arsenal there is a house party it's it's really taking off in north america uh, and the reason for that is because it, it's almost like having a virtual party so that's something else to play with house party john i know you wanted to have uh, have your say as well i just like to reinforce your 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 comment on zoom it's it's uh, not only is zoom useful and relatively low bandwidth and, and high quality but there's an enormous amount of um support material and uh, interesting instructional stuff out there on their website as well just how to work from home how to transform to digital so so one of the big things people are having to do quickly is transform their businesses to digital and um, that's not as easy you know as, as well i don't think we ever thought it was easy but it, it but it's quite challenging to do that the the interesting discovery is that there's it's that there is more out there, it's more possible to make money out of this than perhaps people thought. We were able to have a series of Zoom meetings which, um, which don't involve any travel time, which as long as you have a structure and somebody to coordinate them and call out the names of who's talking, it's a bizarre thing. You need quite, quite a strong control most of the time to let people have their say. As long as you do that, you can have many, many more meetings. But the big gap is when you're running a company or when you're a CEO or a senior uh, manager, is that your job normally isn't just sitting in an office working on your own. It's walking around, engaging people, um, checking the sense of what's going on, building a pattern of the behavior in the business and, and trying to engage people. That becomes quite difficult to do remotely. So it's really worth practicing one's ability to be um, you know, video genic. And, just, and that doesn't mean smiling at the mirror and, and doing all that. It's just eye contact with the camera. Um, staying relaxed, being authentic, um, don't get panicky if you make mistakes, everybody does. It's interesting, I think, that you can have a more human element through the camera than people think, and, and that allows you to, to properly engage. So there's a number of, um, not, not just apps, but methodologies that's worth practicing now. And I think that in two or three months' time, we're going to have a, a whole new set of people who are not only media personalities, but able to engage in new ways, and less formal ways, in ways that really fit um, a flexible, agile sort of economy, which is what we need to build. Yeah, in, in, in our case, for years now, we have had a, a set meeting time, 
uh, at uh, one fifteen in the afternoon. It works with our, our content flow, where our colleagues in um, Edinburgh, Cape Town, London, occasionally Dublin, and of course here in Johannesburg, all get together in one meeting room. And uh, we all look forward to it and we have sure. jokes and fun. And uh, it, it really yeah. is that contact when you're in a remote team that you work as a team. Uh, and I think the chief happiness officer is, is a big part of ensuring that you are still a team rather than as, as individuals just doing your own thing. Stu, I'm sure we got more comments. Thanks, Eric. Yes, uh, Dave has a question around corporate antibodies. He says, do you believe this will force companies not previously used to remote, to remote learning to buy into this concept? Trust and control seem to be the hurdles. John, up your street. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we've gone, it's fascinating from our point of view, we've gone, we've gone virtual. What we're discovering is that um, even in sort of academic rigor, you can still maintain academic rigor in these ways. You don't, you can, there are different ways of handling it. Um, you can still have the criteria to, to make sure people are thinking well. You can actually do more. You can produce short videos, which are, everyone can access anytime they want. Um, you can produce material and guidance. You can have large coaching sessions at any time with no traveling time. So there are multiple advantages of people discovering this as well. And it's also, it's more on demand. So instead of having to sit in the classroom all the day, you might be able to come and do two or three hours and then choose to do the rest of the stuff balanced around your time in a more flexible way. So this sort of virtual learning is, is um, it's not, we're, not, we're never going to go back to the old normal. In fact, the old normal, I think most institutions would understand that that was well outdated anyway. What was missing was the impetus to invent. And what's happening is that we are finding that it's really possible to do engaging education online, stuff that gets people intellectually stimulated, that coaches them at the same time, and gives them a range of material that's sometimes lesser cost, and also allows them to live a life and apply it at the same time um, in a sort of virtual environment. So while there are some times you need to really sit and focus and engage with people and get into a deep conversation, a deep argument, which the classic case study room is best for, um, we're finding that virtual learning is, is what it's all about. And the other point about virtual learning is that learning has moved away from you go to university and then you do. Our whole lives now are about learning and adapting in real time all the time. So part of all our jobs is to keep up to date and train our minds and evolve ourselves. And these methods are perfectly adapted to that. So I think we're in for a, a powerful and much more effective learning future through these than we were before. John, uh, those corporate antibodies that uh, were uh, the question that was raised there, isn't that something also to, uh, to, to take account of? Or do you think because of the, the, it is outdated and because we're moving to a new world, really, that they're just going to be swept away uh, almost like a tidal wave? Well, I mean, I've been teaching MBAs for what, 30 years or so. And I remember in year one, people would say, oh, but the company will never adapt. You know, they're, they're so change resistant. And it's the same story forever. The reality is that this is just the nature of, of us and our minds. We learn something, we embed it into a habit. The habit becomes efficient and allows us to make money. And we rely on it. It's been a cause of our success. But while that's been happening, the context has moved on. So life, corporate life and our own lives and quite often our own psychology is this constant battle between our habits of mind and our habits of action and adaptation to the new reality. So you've got a chief happiness officer, which is a brilliant idea. And I think most organizations need them too. Not so much about the happiness, but to unpack the seriousness of this desperate intent of, you know, this awful seriousness that, that impresses most companies. You don't have to be you know, gloomily serious and, and autocratically controlling to manage large amounts of money and create huge amounts of value for people. Um, you've got to be responsible, but you also need to be flexible and creative, which requires a certain sort of ludic sense of play. Um, so I think we're looking at a different way of doing it. So this corporate antibody story, they're always there. Um, our job is to maintain a certain activist spirit in ourselves, especially as leaders. Otherwise, you will be swept away by the people who are looking at you as the antibody. Thanks, John. I should, 
uh, Shirley's got a comment just on that. She says, our personal and professional lives as well as ways of work will have shifted significantly post-corona. The learning here is to be more human-centric and more deeply mindful of our connectedness. Yeah, Paula, that was what uh, you were you were um, focusing on to a large degree in your presentation. Absolutely, and I think you know this whole work-life balance thing is actually a myth. It doesn't exist. It's about work-life integration and finding a balance that works for me and that makes sense to me and my lifestyle and how I want to live my life. And it's about corporates being able to build that into their corporate culture and allowing employees to be able to find their own sense of balance and I think as John was saying earlier this is where the creativity and the innovation and all of that is going to come in and being some kind of flexible and adaptable or as um, some people like to call it the agile way of working um, so that we can all live the lives that we feel are fulfilling to us and that have a purpose behind it. I love that you know often when when we get new members of our team in in a, a few of the companies that I've had over the last few decades, we always make the point to them that we, we're not acquiring a slice of your brain, which says the time that you're here at the office, uh, that, that you then focus about us. We know that your whole brain is integrating with the rest of your life, your work uh, philosophies, etc. And we try to then tap into that as a, as a team, as a unit, and it really works well if you can get it right. Stu? Thanks, Alec. Um, Johnny Black's got a nice quote on trust from John Wooden. He says, it's better to trust and be disappointed once in a while than to mistrust and be miserable all of the time. Um, so, sorry, to I have have loved, uh, was it better <laughs> to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? <laughs> so, um, there's an interesting one from Nadia, and she says, I'm a tour guide and obviously work has come to total stop. I've now registered to do some free and paid online courses to upgrade my skills. So I'm just running through some comments. Um, Medusa says, does it cost an individual more or less to work from home? And are there guidelines for compensation? I think that's quite a better question. Yeah, uh, just from our side, what we believe on being a remote company is that we give our colleagues all the tools possible to work from home. So just because you are now working from home doesn't mean that you have to use a bad computer or uh, you don't have the same tools that you would have if you were in an office. Uh, but that, that other comment about um, uh, the, the tour guide, was it Nadia? Uh, John, do you have any thoughts on what how Nadia could invest her time given Warren Buffett's wonderful saying that the best investment you can ever make is in yourself? Yeah, and, and that's so true. But there's, there's another angle to this. I, I, I'd be very tempted to give a litany of things you can go online about entrepreneurship. Obviously, it's a brilliant time to learn about digital um, capabilities. And the, the good thing about that is, it, there's so much of it out there. The bad thing about it is there's so much of it out there. So how do you filter your way through? Um, we're actually going to run a, a series, um, not on that, but we're going to run a series of free programs with Henley so shortly on um, helping small and medium enterprises do digital transition because we're going, we're going through it as well. We're going to pull people in from overseas and so that's something that anyone can, can log into to, um, to help. So there will be a number of other initiatives from that. But the biggest, the biggest transition, I think, is, is a little bit more, um, a little bit more Serial. It's our minds are so busy day to day and so preoccupied in the target driven stuff we're doing that we very, very rarely get time to unboot them and reboot them. Our day to day existence is so occupied, it can be quite often difficult to maintain a broader vision, a sense of purpose. So if you just walk around and just focus on what's there and, and lecture and, and ignore what your mind's saying, but just notice notice, 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 or do mindfulness technique, whatever that is, or just follow your breath. And don't try and get an outcome, just let that work on you. What, what one starts to see happening is that you relax, but then your mind goes into places that you've often stopped it from going out of fear or a sense of propriety, or you know, you're trying to maintain an image. Let it go there for a while. Your, your mind's not gonna kill you. It's actually gonna take you to very interesting you're going to get different insights and a broader a broader perspective. I used to be a pilot, and 
if you're a pilot, there's no good staring at your instruments all the time. You've got to take your head out the cockpit and go understand the terrain and the clouds and the environment and the whole thing you're flying through and kind of just just observe it and, and see where you are and all that and where you should go. And I think this gives you that sense of time. And a lot of the things we believe about ourselves are so critically necessary for our identity aren't. And you might just find that you discover bigger, better things in yourself that are being aching to come out, but our business hasn't allowed it to. So I think that's a good opportunity. Mm. Paula, I, I know that you focus a lot on uh, the, the many of us are busy getting busy uh, and or busy staying busy. And I guess this is also a, a little bit of a detox opportunity. Absolutely. You know, we get caught up in that hamster wheel of life and we do, 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 and we don't know how to be anymore. And this is giving us a perfect opportunity to take some, a step back and to just be and to let, as John was saying, those creative juices flowing. And, and I like to use mind maps and to put, you know, on a piece of paper, put your name in the middle and then do mind maps in terms of what are my skills? What are my experience? What are my passions? What are my interests? What are my hobbies? What are things I've always wanted to do on my bucket list item? And create a, a mind map and go go wild and then slowly narrow it down into little pockets of different themes or, or areas of commonality and then work with those and see if something can come from there that can potentially spark some new way of working or some new career shifts or something for yourself. That's so, I'm so pleased to hear that. You know, many, many years ago, I met Tony Bazan. Uh, it was the most extraordinary experience because it was at the World Economic Forum and they have these press conferences with, with people. It must have been 20 years ago. And I was the only one who pitched at the press conference. So I had Tony Bazan to myself for an hour, literally, the, the inventor of mind maps. Now, you can imagine uh, what an impact uh, that makes on one. Uh, subsequent to that and it's also something that I've, I've used ever since and it has it's just so incredible as a tool to find the the uh, uh, the way that you should be going forward so I'm really pleased that you picked uh, pulled that one up Stu anything more from you thanks there's just a few comments so Tracy Crick says if what's working for them so far she says home screen adds another dimension to working from home you have to keep two schedules I'm working in one area my husband in another and the children in their classroom in another area in the house. Our business working schedule now is within the school day time field and we have coffee breaks and lunch at those times. That's just a comment from Tracy. I've got a few more comments, Alec. I'm not really questions. Do you want me to run through them? Please. Uh, John McMurray says, a friend used to go to work in exclamation by driving away and then arriving at work and he'd repeat in the opposite direction at 5 p.m. His family absolutely respected his space. <laughs> I think that's quite funny. Um, <laughs> Karen says, I have an issue that I'm working two jobs, both remotely, and I do have autonomy to take a break or lie down or work longer if needed. But my partner talks to me every time he walks past and then gets very disapproving if I take a break. But I can't work from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. at two different jobs without a break. <laughs> now, stop there. Paula, what does she do? <laughs> so this is where we may need to put boundaries down when it comes to um, what works for us and what we need and the support we need from our partner. You know, um, they obviously have very different perspectives on ways of working and what is being efficient and productive. And one thing isn't necessarily the same for the other. There's no one size fits all. So sit down and explain why is it important that you need this kind of structure and why it works for you and how can you potentially respect that and vice versa. Lovely, Stu. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Paul. A couple more. Norman says he's been working from home for the last 15 years. He finds that making sure that you have your office space and your non-office space is essential. So, for example, he's busy writing a memoir, and when he, write, when he works on the book, he writes somewhere else in the house, not in his workspace. When I'm writing professionally, I write in my workspace. My wife also works at home much of the time, and she has her own workspace. She tends to overflow into our shared home space, and when that happens, it results in a measure of conflict. Because of rigid commitments, I have... For the one paper I write, I work hard at getting my writing done by Cozer of Business Friday, even though loud only happens on a Sunday. I work hard to avoid working on a Saturday. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's anything you can help there with Paula. So yeah, I think um, it's really around how do we how do we respect each other's spaces and ways of working, um, and. You know, at the same time, despite all of this now working on top of each other, and if there are children involved, how do we still find time for each other in this as a couple? 
And just because we're in lockdown and confinement doesn't mean that we can't have quality time together to build our relationship and to really connect with each other on a deeper level than just the day-to-day -day chores and kids and work. Um, so, for example, you know, if your kids are young enough and they have a routine and they go to bed at 8 o'clock at night, then perhaps get up at night. Um, have a, a dinner on the patio and a glass of wine and just really connect on a deeper level so that you don't miss each other at the same time. Thanks, Stuart. Any, um, any last comments before we ask our, our uh, panelists yeah. to wrap up? Thanks, Eric. It's just from Eric. He says, on the funny side, I've had, I've had comments from numerous colleagues on Zoom calls that they can hear my dogs snoring in the background, etc. He says, oh, the loud snoring. Home working. But I think, that, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I think that's more the new normal because it was two, two, a couple of years ago when the, the guy on BBC, his kid ran in, it was such a shock. But I think that's the new norm with this whole remote, remote concept. I'm not sure what anyone else thinks. Yeah, well, we've, we, <laughs> we've noticed that on, <laughs> in your family is too, <laughs> pretty often. Yeah. John, a uh, little, little, uh, we've we got a couple of minutes left before the witching hour. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's two things. One is obviously how we adapt, how we manage our pattern, etc. But there's another slightly tougher reality that we're facing, which is, is COVID and the consequence it'll have. So we are going to. Um, we are going to struggle. It's, uh, we're going to live through quite a tricky time, that's obvious. And uh, we'll have economic challenges as well. And a number of companies will be struggling and a number of individuals will be struggling. So, um, and then we'll come out at the end of it with an economy in not such good shape, obviously, uh, and a need to recover. So I don't think we're ever going to go back to the old normal. And I don't think this is in any way a possibility for holiday. I think the really important reality, which is, I'm sorry to say it, but it's quite tough, is that we have to engage really hard at retooling ourselves and building not only our businesses, but helping everyone get business up and running, because we don't want to come out of this into a desert of broken businesses. This is probably the first time in my life that I can remember that the the need for, need for absolute collaboration and interdependence is so stark. Not just the disease, which in a sense is, is making us realize that, um, that we're all the same, but also the need for us to work together to, to understand that we cannot come out into a destroyed economy. We have to work and help each other in every way we can to go up. So it's hard work time. So yes, we've got family, we're dealing with that, but it's not gonna go back to normal. We have to lay the groundwork to have an economic recovery at the end of this. And for this, We've got an obligation, I think, to work and work hard in this period. I'm sorry to say. Paula, last words? Yeah, I think I agree with John in terms of collaboration, um, not only from a business point of view, but also um, at a community level and at a family level and at a relational level, so that we can come out of this intact um, as, as couples, as families, as communities, but also as businesses and the nation at large. Well, thanks to John Foster Pedley, the Dean of Henley Business School, and to Paula Quincy. And uh, I'm just going to give you, there we go. There's uh, Paula's books, and you can contact her on the various uh, um, addresses that you see on the screen. It's been a pleasure being with you today, and we look forward to our next engagement. Till the next time, I'm Alec Hogg. Cheerio.